School of Public Health Pandemic Center kickoff, newly approved center for the School of Public Health. I'm very excited today that we'll be hearing from the center's leaders, Jennifer Nuzzo, uh, pay attention to how I pronounce that. <laughs> that is, uh, if anybody who's taken a class from me, one of the things I always say the first day, it's very important for me to correct people's names, for me to pronounce people's names correctly. And, you know, before she got here, all I heard was Jennifer Nuzzo, but it's actually Jennifer Nuzzo. Okay, so I'm going to start off correctly, set the record straight, and then we'll be joined by Beth Cameron, one of her <coughs> colleagues who are the, the leaders of this new pandemic center. Before I hand things over to Jennifer and Beth, however, I just want to give a brief background on the amazing center and his mission, as well as a proper introduction to its leaders. The Pandemic Center's mission is to change policy and practice to prevent pandemics and other biological emergencies and the harms they pose to health, security, and prosperity. The Pandemic Center at Brown can be an independent voice for disruption. The goal is to investigate the lessons we have learned from COVID-19 and other events, work closely with practitioners to pilot new evidence-based approaches, to advocate for systemic and sustained changes in government and civil society, and to work with policymakers to ensure funding and policy that are aligned uh, with the need for change. For these goals, I can't think of two better people to lead this initiative than Jennifer and Beth. That's the part that I got to get right. Jen is a professor of epidemiology here at the School of Public Health. She is director of the new Pandemic Center. She's an epidemiologist by training. Her work focuses on global health security, public health preparedness and response, and health systems resilience. In addition to her scholarly work, Dr. Nuzzo regularly advises national governments, for-profit and not-for-profit organizations on pandemic preparedness and response, including COVID-19. Dr. Nuzzo also regularly engages with national media outlets to educate and inform about emerging health security trends. I have no doubt that you've seen her on CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, um, guest of podcasts. So there's not too many places where she has not appeared, uh, including you probably read a ton of her articles in New York Times. In addition, I would like to introduce Beth Cameron, the center's senior advisor. She is a professor of the practice in health services policy and practice and is a national expert in health security, pandemic preparedness, biosecurity, and biodefense. Beth is a key member of the school's pandemic prevention, preparedness, and response leadership. And we're really lucky to have both of them here as part of the Brown University community. Beth has worked at the highest levels of government, including helping to establish for President Obama and reestablish for President Biden, the White House National Security Council, Health Security Office, and the role of a special assistant to the president and senior director for global health security and biodefense. Now, from the very first day that I met Jennifer, um, I knew that she was something special. She was here looking for a house uh, before she moved down and we met for coffee. And the, the thing that you're gonna, the thing that hits you immediately is that she's a big thinker, comprehensive thinker, and has a real sense of urgency, which I, which I think is, is really needed um, today. Um, the other thing that, that you learned about her very quickly is that she is authentically and deeply committed to issues of health equity. She had everything that she does has a lens towards health equity, and she is very interested in multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary collaboration. She wants to work with everybody. And just anecdotally, I'll tell a quick story. When, um, when the proposal for the center was presented to the Academic Priorities Committee, there were, um, people were so excited about it. And 
some of the usual suspects, data science folks, of course, um, all the life sciences folks, but then some unusual suspects like history, classics, very excited about this proposal and anxious to get involved in some way. And so that is a testament. And, and Jennifer is like excited to bring him in. I'm not sure how, but she wants to she wants to work with him. So I think that undermine that sort of that states that understand that um that basically states how important this is and how expansive it is. I mean, everybody wanted in. I was looking at my colleague who was sitting to my left, who's in Portuguese languages. So you want in on this? <laughs> um, but um, we're very excited to have both of them. The other, the other thing that you'll notice when you meet Beth is that she has a, an intense sense of enthusiasm also. She's thinking about classes she wants to teach already. She's, I mean, she's really, they're bringing a, a certain kind of energy that's gonna be very interdisciplinary. It will, it will intersect with a lot of the things that we already have going on in the School of Public Health. And, uh, and across campus. So I think for those of you who are just starting out your training and career in public health, this is a great place to be, and it's a great time to be in public health. So without further ado, I'm gonna uh, introduce you to um, Jennifer Nuzzo, uh, Director of the Pandemic Center. And I think, is Beth on? Okay, and Beth Cameron, who you'll hear from as well. Thank you, Jennifer. So much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dean O'Bear. It's really such a privilege to be at Brown, but it's really a privilege to be here today to talk to you about the Pandemic Center um, that we're building and hope that you'll be um, willing to join us in, in building this Pandemic Center and to tackle the issues um, that are meeting us right now in this moment and, and um, will continue to meet us in the future. So just a little bit about me and how I came to work on pandemic related issues. Um, I got my start in public health um, shortly after the events of September 11th. I was a practicing epidemiologist in New York City. And with this event, the world, my life and my career changed. Um, if you remember, and some of you are probably too young to remember, um, this was a very common scene in 2001, it's still a common scene, but particularly in 2001, this is what you saw if you went to any, um, you know, uh, publicly occupied place in New York City. This is what security looked like in 2001 in New York City. What you probably also didn't know is that we had other forms of security in New York City, and it looked more like this. Um, some of these were part of the surveillance system that I ran in New York City. Um, the guy on the left is, uh, is a fish, as you can see. Um, it's, he's the aquatic version of a canary in a coal mine who was trying to make sure nobody was poisoning the drinking water in New York City. The medicines are what we use to make sure people weren't getting sick in ways that would be unusual. This is an early form of syndromic surveillance, if you're familiar with, with that approach. And that was my job to run that. And so that is how my career, which initially started um, in environmental health and concerned about drinking water quality and safety, um, entered into the realm of security. And really, from there on, I worked at, in the nexus of health and security. And in fact, there's now a field that's officially called health security, and it really you know, grew out of some of these concerns and the concerns that followed it. I don't work in New York City anymore. I left the city and I joined academia and I've been working on pandemic related um, research and preparedness issues um, since, you know, for about 20 years. And um, that includes uh, COVID-19. And uh, this is actually one of the first blog posts uh, that we did our team that um, when I was at Johns Hopkins prior to coming here, ran the outbreak observatory there, um, we wrote a blog post and you can see dated January 2nd, which was our first attempt to look at what was going on in this unusual outbreak that was happening in, in China. Um, you know, this is not my first pandemic. There, there were ones prior and there are many other important events that we studied and learned from over the past 20 years. And so, you know, we bring all of that experience um, in thinking about not only COVID, but the events of the future. 
So I had seen a lot of events and studied a lot of events and had been quite familiar with what happens. We've also done a lot of exercises over the years. That's where you kind of simulate events and see how people react. So you see a lot of commonalities in all of these events that give you some indication of what's going to happen. But for me personally, this scene in the early days of COVID-19 was like nothing I ever expected to see. This is a completely empty Times Square, New York City. Times Square is never empty, but it was empty this day. And so for me, that moment in early March, 2020, that's when I knew that we are experiencing something quite different. That is when I knew that we had failed. We had failed in terms of our preparedness because had things gone the way we expected them to go, this would have never happened. And so I really take this forward in thinking about future events and making sure that we don't have to live again where pandemic threats are able to upend our lives in the way that this one did. If you study these events, and in this way, COVID is no anomaly, um, we see some commonalities in terms of how they affect us. They affect us in multiple ways. There's, of course, the direct harms from the virus itself, the infections, the deaths, the long term symptomatic impacts. They affect us in the ways that they disrupt our health care and the worsening of outcomes of all sorts of other diseases and conditions. And they affect us socially and economically and politically. Now, in terms of the direct effects, um, this is actually a screenshot of the Hopkins um, COVID site. I was part of the team that uh, worked on this and some of the other data. This is from this morning. And basically, main point here is, as of today, there's upwards of six and a half million deaths reported glo globally. And we know that this is an undercount because this is just the tests that have been diagnosed and reported. This is staggering, absolutely staggering. Even as an undercount, it's staggering, but then thinking about the magnitudes that we haven't yet been able to account for, it's completely staggering. And of course, we know that the impact of these deaths, and the sickness, and the disabilities have not been shared equally among us. We know that certain groups have been disproportionately affected. And here are some of the, the staggering data. This comes from the CDC. It took quite a bit of time for us to get the data um, to, in order to be able to understand this, despite the fact that these sort of disparities are things that we see very frequently in public health emergencies. Now, I will tell you, um, while these outcomes are probably not surprising to anyone in the field of public health, because we see this with so many other diseases and conditions, I spent a considerable amount of time at the beginning of this pandemic trying to convince policymakers that this wasn't just how it is, or that this isn't just due to things that we can't solve. I tried to talk to them that those disparities are a product of a poor response. So I mentioned that it was, took a while to get the data that we needed to understand um, what we should have expected to see, which is that COVID was gonna um, disproportionately affect others unless we did something about it. And um, it took even longer to figure out um, what part of our response contributed to it. Now it's probably a lot of different things, but one of the things that we were able to look at in the very few states that actually collected data about the racial and ethnic breakdown of who they were testing for COVID, basically who they were going out trying to diagnose infections among, and who presumably they were trying to stop infections from, and who they were presumably trying to link to care. And what we saw, given the very poor data that only existed for about eight or nine states, was that unsurprisingly, we were under testing in the communities that had been hardest hit by the virus. So what this shows is that we weren't necessarily using the COVID demographic data to help us intervene, to help us target our resources to try to lessen those impacts. This is something we have to fix. We also know that not everybody had the same abilities to protect themselves. Here's just one study. I'm sure there's more we need to do more in order to understand what enabled people to follow public health advice, but one thing seemed clear, income. Not surprising, not all of us could Zoom for two years. Not all of us could afford N95 masks 
Not all of us had a place to safely isolate so that we wouldn't pass on the virus to our loved ones. Not everybody has the extra bedroom that they can retreat to if they tested positive. Not all of us could afford to test positive and take off multiple weeks of work. Turning to the broader health impacts of COVID, there are so many different pieces that we can pull from. I just pulled a few data that I think are, are quite concerning. Um, we see, of course, a drop in HIV testing. I think some of it is starting to recover, but nonetheless, um, this is something that we saw, something that we've also seen in, in past events. Um, this school has been a national leader in terms of addressing the opioid crisis, and I'm um, sure these data showing um, some concerning trends uh, during the pandemic are no surprise to people in this room. These health impacts matter. It's not just the virus and what it does to us, it's all of the harms to our health during a pandemic. An effective pandemic response doesn't dismiss these other effects, it's inclusive of these other effects. It tries to mitigate these other effects. It plans for them and then works to make sure they don't happen. And then the broader social and economic political impacts. I will tell you, we spent way too much time during this pandemic arguing if it's health or economy as if those two things can exist without one another. And I will say in terms of what the overall social, economic and political impacts of this pandemic have been and what the causes are and what contributed, I will just say it's, it's I think, a research area still in progress. But nonetheless, some of the headlines that I've pulled here, I think, point to areas that we have to explore further. We have seen a rollback in support for routine immunizations. We have seen a rollback in public health emergency powers, which for me, as someone who got the start of start of her career after September 11th and saw states put into place those powers that in case we ever had a bioterrorist or a biological attack, we wouldn't be caught flat footed. When I see the rollback of those emergency powers that we work so hard to put into place for, for a national emergency, that's really, really um, stunning to me. Of course, we're hearing all sorts of things. Children disproportionately um, affected in terms of their, their lives and their livelihoods and future prosperity in terms of their um, educational attainment and what that will mean for their future health and development and, and economic attainment. And then we're hearing rumblings of a potential global recession. Now, we don't know for sure if that's going to happen, but I have to tell you that particularly worries me because um, what we saw in the United States and actually elsewhere um, was that the global recession of the 2008 was probably one of the biggest catalytic impacts in terms of eroding our preparedness. So we went in to COVID-19, our response to COVID-19 with fewer assets than we had in place prior to 2008, in part because of the global recession caused governments to pull back, to lay off, to uh, get rid of capacities that they had spent years developing after 2001. So stay tuned. Um, I think there's going to be more that we can see, but we have to work to enumerate all of these things because again, we need to understand what the impacts are so that we can work to mitigate them. And also so that we can make the case for why investing in preparedness matters and what it means in terms of, of return on those investments. And then one area where I think we need more work and one thing that is also quite chilling to me is the potential um, impacts that this pandemic has had in terms of, um, of you know, perhaps uh, rolling back uh, democratic, democratic progress. This is an area uh, that we're going to talk about a bit more in terms of potential areas of work of the pandemic center. Um, but uh, the rising narrative that we heard uh, throughout at least the first year of the pandemic that democracies were failing in their response to COVID-19 and authoritarian governments were succeeding, I actually don't believe that right, that narrative, but nonetheless, the fact that the narrative rose is problematic. And so I'm talking to you about all this. Um, despite what you may have heard, <laughs> COVID is not over, um, but Putting COVID aside, even if COVID were in fact over, which I don't agree, um, it is not the last worry of ours. Even when we account for improved surveillance, we see that there has been an increasing frequency of emerging infectious disease outbreaks that has occurred steadily with each decade. Now, not only do these go on to become pandemics, some of them could, and even if they don't, they can still pose 
um, considerable challenges. So this should tell us that there will be more pandemic threats in our future. We don't know when, we don't know how frequently, but we think it's going to happen more frequently than we used to have before. I would argue that pandemic threats are the new normal in our lives. They are the recurring hazards of our times. They are the conditions of our lives that we have to prepare for so that we don't let these conditions overtake our lives. And I think if you look to the field of natural hazards, you'll see some analogies that I think can inform our preparedness for future pandemics. But events like COVID and emerging infectious disease outbreaks are also not necessarily our, our most serious concern, right? We have now in an age of the, the biotech revolution, the same thing that gives us cures and um, potentially uh, increased lifespans, many of these advances could also be misused and they can be weaponized and they can pose deliberate threats or they could accidentally release and cause harms. So these are the, the, the realities and we have to plan for these realities and have planned to address these realities. So that's grim, <laughs> but now here I turn to the optimistic part because if it were just about threats that we couldn't do anything about, we should just all go home, right? Because public health is on the way out and that is clearly not the case. I have actually never been more optimistic about our abilities to tackle these threats. And the way I have derived my optimism, I said that I thought there were other natural hazards that we can look to. And in a moment when I was getting uh, about actually this time, was it last year? Yeah, this time last year, I was getting a lot of questions. This was pre-Omicron. I was getting a lot of questions like, is the pandemic over? Is the pandemic over? I think there's a seasonality to when people ask, is the pandemic over? And it seems to happen in sort of late summer, early fall. But I was getting a lot of questions and I was worried that people were taking from, at that point, the declining cases, the idea that COVID was past us, this once in a century health crisis that had, as it had been branded was beyond, was behind us. And now we had 99 years of relative peace until we had to worry about it again. And given the data I just showed you, that's clearly not the case. So what then can we do to um, convince people that um, this, just because uh, one pandemic may end at some point, doesn't mean that we don't have to worry in the future. And so I began looking to, for some other metaphors and I started stumbling on fires and the fact that once we put out a fire, we don't assume that we'll never have a fire again. And that actually got me um, interested and to the point of the historians who were eager to collaborate. And it's one of the reasons why I'm very eager to collaborate with them because of my amateur um, historical sleuthing. Uh, I started digging into the Great Baltimore Fire of 1904. And um, uh, it's a really fascinating uh, story if you have time to look into it. But basically, one of the things I noticed is that how come when you go to museums and you hear about these great, these great fires of XXXX, XX, we don't seem to talk about those anymore. And that is because those fires kept happening with some regularity until we made changes. And now as a result of those changes, the frequency and severity of great urban conflagrations is not what it was in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And so I looked into all of the changes that were made nationally in the US after the Great Baltimore and Fire of 1904, and I found that they were sort of loosely binned into um, three areas, which I conveniently um, came up with an alliterative acronym for, um, but basically it was data drills and defense. And the more that I started thinking about those three areas, it occurred to me that those are very three areas that were we to make advancements, we could do the same for pandemic threats as we did for urban conflagrations. So we can apply these same principles. And so I'm not spend too time, much time, but let me just kind of sketch very loosely how changes in each of those three areas can make a huge difference in terms of reducing the frequency and severity of fires. What if we created national data systems that enabled early detection of pandemic threats that would buy us some time to act and to know what to do to act and to support our decision makings about how to act? I will tell you one of the biggest frustrations to me is that I can't tell you where people are contracting COVID. Yet answering that question is really important for knowing what measures to employ to stop it, right? What if we had better evidence for figuring out which measures we should employ 
instead of just like the throw them all at the pandemic, try to maintain them for three years and hope nobody gets frustrated by that, right? And then what if we were able to, from the beginning, develop tools that allow people to know when it's safe to gather, go to work and go to school? We have rapid tests now. I think that's a great advancement. They're too expensive. Most people can't access them, as particularly in the hardest hit communities. But the fact that they exist, I think it potentially gives people more um, freedom than what happens. We need policy levers to support it, et cetera. But those tools, I think, are important and potentially paint to what we could do in the future. In terms of drills. I would argue that we have not had a pandemic playbook that works. We shut a lot of stuff down in March of 2020, and then we actually never had a plan B. We never pivoted. I think we thought the virus would disappear. I didn't, but some people did, thought the virus would disappear if we just stayed home for three, six, two weeks, whatever people thought that it would disappear. But then we never transitioned to something else. We needed the full playbook to understand what to do next. And we need the playbooks to not just be written to the average case, people who could stay home in zoom for two years but to also include the essential workers who couldn't and the people who just couldn't afford to quarantine or isolate or wear the n95 mask we also need to involve communities and businesses in this work tap them for solutions tap them as equitable partners and involve them in our work as opposed to holding them at bay with our work and then we have multiple opportunities to practice every flu season. Measles is probably coming back. <laughs> we have a lot of opportunities to practice these playbooks, to exercise them, to test them, to continuously improve them so they get better and so that they work for more people. And then on defense, and I use this mostly to mean people, you guys, the next generation of public health leaders, the workforce, we need to staff and equip health departments with enough workers to not just manage the day-to-day -day threats, and there are a lot of them, but also the emergencies. And now, as we're seeing multiple emergencies at once, we can't just decimate them, gut them, and then when there's an emergency, wait for weeks for Congress to decide if it wants to appropriate emergency funds, and then hire a few contractors to come in for a few months and do something, and then when the money lapses, the, the capacities lapse. We saw the direct consequences of this. Uh, in the early days of monkeypox, when health departments didn't have many of the COVID contract workers that they had because Congress congressional funding for those workers had expired. So they went into monkeypox with, again, not enough people, just like they went into COVID with not enough people. And then we have to make sure that our plans and our leaders reflect our entire society and its values. Okay, so I'm gonna now turn to, given that, given that there's a lot we can do, what are we here at Brown, the Pandemic Center, all of you guys who hopefully will come and help us do about this? So I'm gonna to talk to you what we are thinking with the Pandemic Center, would love your feedback and would love your participation and help us even grow the ideas beyond what Beth and I and the people that we've talked to so far have so far imagined. So here's our mission statement. We are working to stop pandemics and other biological emergencies Pandemics are a really bad case. Um, as I mentioned, there's other scenarios that we worry about as well as smaller scenarios that, like I said, offer lots of opportunities to get better at what we do. We're not just trying to stop those events. We're also, if we're not able to prevent them um, entirely, make sure that they can't again pose undue harms to our health, our peace, our security, our prosperity, our wellness. I have never believed more than I do today that that academia is the one to lead this. And I say that in part because while a lot of the work that needs to be done is probably the work of governments, um, independent, credible voices are needed to make sure that work gets done, to tell the actors who need to do the work what work they need to do, to bring evidence to those conversations. We have unfortunately, I think, seen erosion in trust in government and I think a rise in people looking for external voices to tell them what to do. I, like I'm sure many of you, if you tell people you work in public health, have over the past you know, several years gotten countless, countless questions. What should I do? What should I do? What should I do? 
Sometimes I'll ask people, you know, do you think you can talk to your healthcare provider? I will tell you very frequently the people who come to me don't have a healthcare provider. So academia, I think, is incredibly important to not only generate the evidence, as we always do, to look to identify with a path forward, but to continue to be the voice, to educate people so that they are equipped with life-saving knowledge, to hold governments accountable, to keep these issues in the national and global conversation. So that's the premise of the Brown Pandemic Center to be that, that voice and to, to work for positive disruption. We wanna make the world a better place and we have the tools, the know-how and the platforms and the trust to be able to do that. Now, the way that we'll work will be in you know, four bins. Um, obviously, research is an incredibly important work. As I said, there's a lot of really important response questions that we still are struggling with today, and we will certainly struggle in the future for which we need to generate more evidence. Doesn't mean that you don't act until the evidence is there. We also have to weigh in on what we know so far, because that's better than just completely weighing it. Um, but making sure uh, that the information is there um, so that we know uh, what, what to do and have that based on data and evidence. But we can't stop there. And I think this is one perhaps difference in terms of how we're envisioning the center than perhaps other research centers may have been envisioned. But we need to then work to take that information and to make sure it gets translated into, into practice and policies and resources. We need to spend as much time, if not more, talking to the decision makers, making sure they understand the, the, the knowledge, talking to the public, make sure they understand the data. We also, I think, at this moment, need to rethink public health education, because I will tell you, seeing how public health agencies struggled, we need to make sure that the next generation of leaders is equipped with all of the skills, not just for the threats of today, but the, the threats of, of the future. And I think that this school is actually doing really groundbreaking work to that end. Um, and that's really a big part of why I came to Brown. Uh, one of the things I was so impressed by when I came up to visit almost this, almost this time last year was how proud people were to talk to me about their collaborations with the state and other community-based organizations. And that's like what you do day in and day out and that may not seem special, but let me tell you, it's incredibly rare for schools of public health. And that alone was one reason why I wanted to come here. And then we also have to educate beyond the walls of this institution and beyond the gates. Access to life saving information shouldn't depend on whether or not you're enrolled in a degree granting program right, so we have to continue to work with the public. And we have to continue to work with the public who may not want to hear what we have to say. To bridge the divide to depoliticize public health to engage with people to hear their stories to understand what their experiences were during this past pandemic I am actually deeply concerned that a lot of the reporting on how the pandemic was reduced a lot of the country to headlines. And if you talk to people who live in red states and other communities there's a lot more nuance and a lot more information that I think we have to learn from. The other reason why I came to Brown is this. Um, you, I don't know if you know this, but Brown is famous really for, for, for doing interdisciplinary collaboration for real. I mean, a lot of institutions talk about it, but they don't actually do it. Brown actually does it. And this graphic showing uh, the faculty collaboration was really stunning to me. I mean, that you see like religious studies and molecular biology. I mean, it's really amazing. But honestly, as I showed you, pandemics touch all of, they touch all of health. So everyone in public health, I think, has a role to play in, in, in the work that we do, but they touch all of society. So we need to avail ourselves of the best evidence and information and learnings from other disciplines if we're truly going to tackle the very hardest problems. And I think that Brown, above all, is positioned best to do this because of this. So we have work ongoing um, and I just want to talk to you a little bit about it a couple of projects and then I want to talk to you about the projects ahead and actually I'm going to turn over to Beth at that point but just to say some of the projects that are ongoing one of the things that we're looking into is how countries and particularly for this we're focusing on low and middle income countries but how they were able to not just respond to COVID but also meet their communities other health needs maintain essential health services and this is a project that we're doing in partnership with Gates Ventures Global Health Exemplars programs you're familiar Gates Ventures is the personal office of Bill Gates and the Global Health Exemplars Program looks for models of, of success in order to say it can be done. 
and to prove to countries that there are approaches that you can take. And so I'm um, uh, really excited about this project that's underway. We're working in four different countries um, and um, uh, gonna be wrapping up um, some of that, that work um, shortly. Uh, we are also working in, in the space of um, improving pandemic data to support decision making. A lot of different projects there. One example is the Global Health Security Index, which is a project um, that I co-lead with partners at the Nuclear Threat Initiative and Economist Impact. This is giving us the global picture of which countries have what capacities so that we know where there are gaps and what, how the gaps can be filled. And then um, we continue to engage with policymakers and the public and the media on a variety of issues. And let me tell you, uh, I started at Brown in April and the number of um, infectious disease threats that have emerged since then is really staggering to me. Um, uh, clearly monkeypox, I think, uh, was a another wake up call in terms of our readiness for infectious disease emergencies that was should have been a slam dunk and the fact that it wasn't is yet more um, concerning evidence of of work, more work that needs to be done um and so we're engaging in multiple ways sometimes we have quiet conversations with our contacts and government sometimes we write op-eds sometimes we engage directly with the media uh, i just pulled this as an example so it was a fun one i got to do was to engage with um, the john oliver's team on a a piece that they did on monkeypox. If you haven't seen it, it's really funny. John Oliver is really funny and, and really good at distilling very complex kind of wonky issues into like something you actually want to listen to, even if you don't spend 40 hours of your week plus thinking about these issues. Um, and I think that these sorts of engagements are important for kind of shaping political and also public um, sentiments on these issues. Um, but we have projects in the pipeline um, now that the, the center is formally launched, and um, these are just the projects that we are digging on. But um, over the weeks and months ahead, we're hoping to have additional partnerships and collaborations with other researchers here in the school and across the university. And some of our work is early work is going to be dedicated to just figuring out all of the ongoing pandemic related research that's happening at Brown. I will tell you, I've scratched the surface a little bit and there's a ton out there. It's hard to know about. So one of my jobs, I think, is to find it and to amplify it and to make sure everybody does know about it and then to take the learnings from that research and make sure it gets translated to evidence. Um, but we have projects uh, teed up in sort of three areas and I'm going to pause and let Beth talk to you about that so you can hear from her perspective um, uh, what these projects are about and what they'll mean um, given her prior experience. Thanks, Jen. Um, can you hear me OK? Yes, and I'm going to make you slightly larger. <laughs> okay. Hi, everyone. It's really nice to meet you, and we definitely want to save time for questions. Um, and Jen, that was a fantastic introduction to the center. I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the things that we have planned ahead and how students and faculty fit into some of those approaches. And I'll just say literally like a one minute snippet about why I decided to, to join the Pandemic Center um, and Jen and really um, a huge thank you to Dean O'Bear um, for that extremely kind introduction. Um, I came into this field in September around the time of September 11th as well. And I landed on Capitol Hill working in health policy, but my career took a turn into national security. And I spent most of my career actually at state, the Department of Defense, and then a huge chunk of it actually at the White House, working on pandemic risks um, at the National Security Council. And I never thought that I would both get the opportunity to build an office in the NFC focused on pandemics, nor that I would have to come back in and rebuild that office during a pandemic um, that you know I, I didn't think that we'd actually live to see. And these types of pragmatic planned initiatives that are translational, that fit in with public policy, that take advantage of the cross-disciplinary work at Brown are exactly why I came. That diagram that shows the, the multi-stakeholder approach at Brown is exactly what I tried to instill at the White House in building agency relationships and bringing people in because we can't do this in silos. Um, so I'm just gonna hit these three initiatives. There will be more and there are already more so we're really looking forward to the feedback on these but also importantly your ideas jen already mentioned the importance of preparing pandemics preparing democracies for pandemics um, watching um, from the white house how the united states of america dealt with this pandemic um, when i joined rejoined the government in 2021 was a real um, earth shaker for me to recognize that communities did not feel well served by government 
that communities did not feel that they had playbooks that worked for them um, was, was a recognition for me that not only does this continue to be a bipartisan endeavor, but that we really need to get out there and develop tools that work for communities that are prepared in advance of biological threats. And so Jen talked a bit about those types of tools. Um, we are looking forward to launching an initiative in this area, and we're going to work with partners obviously partners across the Brown community, but also partners that work um, in red states, blue states, purple states, that work with public health institutions, and also work with state and local government, because we're not gonna be able to tackle this issue of bringing public health and what public health means back into communities in a realistic way in time for the next pandemic if we don't. So that's number one. Number two, um, we're not going to have the people that we need to be able to run these types of complex responses if we don't train them differently. And this begins um, at undergraduate institutions and schools of public health. It also bleeds into medical schools and I think many other fields, um, including public administration. And so I'm really excited about Brown's programs in these areas. And we're already working on an initial set of course modules that we'd really like to begin at a hub at Brown that bring public health leaders together with future national security leaders in order to develop the kinds of no hesitation, no regrets, lean forward um, responses that we need and really to bring together what I view as the separate, the three or four different tracks of people who land in the situation with the White House working on pandemics. There are disaster responders, there are public health and global health leaders. There are people trained in national security. There are people trained in biomedical science. And I'm shorthanding here, but that's generally the mix of people that find their way into the situation room. And sometimes they are really not speaking the same language. I've spent most of my career on that issue and COVID really brought home for me that we have to start way earlier than we're starting. And so there's no better place in my view to start this work than Brown. I think this is an area that is just beginning and where we need a lot of feedback and work. Um, the third is translating pandemic risk into public action. So this is really, um, it really fits nicely with the other two approaches and particularly the approach on preparing democracies for pandemics where we wanna work with stakeholders and communities across the public and the private sector. I think Jen mentioned, um, and if she didn't um, yeah, hit, hit on it um, here as much as she's always um, speaking um, from personal experience about the number of private sector um, individuals who reached out to her during the pandemic and reached out to, to many of us really struggling to figure out what to do. And employers are going to be early adopters of public health measures in any pandemic. And we need to provide them with better playbooks and tools as well. We're also going to be working in the area of biosafety and biosecurity, recognizing that, that some worse, um, worse, larger scale, globally catastrophic biological risks could be caused by an accidental or deliberate biological event. And so we're partnering with a not-for-profit in Washington that looks at biosafety and biosecurity to figure out how to build some of that normative training into our public health um, work as well. Next slide. We're also going to be bringing this to DC. So the Pandemic Center is um, working with the Brown and DC program and with the National Press Building to build out a space in Washington. We're really excited about this. And one of my roles with the Pandemic Center will be helping to build this out and to um, really provide opportunities um, for students and for faculty, for the center and for the school um, to be able to partake of roundtables, policy discussions, involvement in the three initiatives that I just mentioned, and also just generally, we hope, a place for people to hang their hats when they come into Washington. But I think most importantly and at the heart is providing some opportunities for future public health leaders to experience public policy early on and to get some of that cross training as early as possible. Next slide. So this slide is really my sort of insider perspective, bird's eye view on what we need to do. And Jen mentioned a lot of these issues already. So I'll just be really quick and say, this can boil, be boiled down to my bottom line up front, which is we need to be more routine. We need to not hesitate. Speed is absolutely critical. And we need to do these things every time. Um, and we need to do them without waiting for decisions that will take weeks and weeks to, um, to put into place. And so that comes back to having playbooks. It comes back to building capacity, both in this country and around the world to deal with all manner of biological catastrophes, including surging testing, surging countermeasures and routine ways to do that. It includes more effective decision-making tools 
so that the public health community doesn't hesitate and is able to help communities with those pragmatic decisions and those support packages that I think need to be ready. We need better, faster data. Um, Jen made this point better than I ever could, but this is vital. We can't make decisions if we don't have data and we don't have the tools to get that data as quickly as we need it. Um, and we don't have the facility to get that back to communities to really help them be better prepared. I mentioned that we need to be prepared for accidental and deliberate biological events. It's getting easier and easier to make things from scratch um, with biology, as many of you know, um, and I'm really excited to, to work in that area and build it into our curriculum. We need to build that next generation of diverse public health leaders, and we need to have those packages of community support ready to go. Next slide, and this is getting close to the end, so that if you have questions, you should be thinking about them. Um, this slide, um, when I created this, Sorry. no, no problem. The, the slide that's about to come up next, um, really surprises me anything things don't surprise me very much i've i've lived through and worked through a lot of crazy things and a lot of crazy situations in a lot of crazy places and um next slide this next slide um actually surprised me and it is showing the outbreaks that have occurred um in the past um last 10 years and it's not every outbreak that's occurred in the last 10 years but it's a number of them and then the top of the chart are outbreaks um, that have really occurred. Um, and I'm not sure if you're showing this slide, but it's okay. There are outbreaks that are ongoing now, and I'll just hit them even if we're not hitting the slide. Um, those outbreaks include um, the African swine fever outbreak on, that's happening right now on Hispaniola that many of you may, may not actually be tracking, but which is a huge economic risk for the United States. It includes obviously ongoing, um, the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, the monkeypox response. It includes polio cases um, re-emerging in places due to lower vaccination rates around the world, as most of you know. It also includes obviously Ebola resurging, um, the Sudan strain of Ebola resurging in Uganda. And just on and on, this is just telling us that we need to be prepared now and we need to have that next generation as urgently as possible. And then if we could hit the last slide, and Jen, you might want to come back up for this one. Yes, and um, so as I mentioned uh, earlier, this is just what we are sketching out, but um, we know that part of our work, and, and we won't be successful unless we build on the work that's already being done here. I mean, another reason why both Beth and I came to Brown um, is because of the role that this university played as um, in, in terms of its thought leadership during the pandemic. We obviously want to build on that and continue to, to um, develop and amplify it. Um, Beth, we've talked about a lot about the next generation of pandemic um, decision makers. I think we also have a role to play in terms of defining what public health curricula should be for the future, given what we've learned from COVID and to identify where, where gaps are. Um, as I mentioned, we're going to spend time trying to figure out what related work is going on here to encourage additional work to maybe make connections that um, didn't already happen, though a, a tremendous amount of connections I think have already happened. Um, we want to know about your work in this space or if you're interested in working on this space um, and to try to you know, facilitate the research as best we can, uh, try to grow the research uh, dollars available to the school. Uh, I, and um, to make sure that the results of this research gets translated into effective um, evidence and policies. Um, we can't do this alone just as a university. We also have to partner with other entities, both here in the US and abroad, um, and you know, to continue to grow the Brown's uh, global presence. And then uh, a lot of students have already reached out, which is incredibly encouraging. And I think part of our work, not just here in Providence, but also in DC, and uh, is to try to create additional learning opportunities uh, for students. Uh, so perhaps in, in, uh, in our work here, DC, and then with, with other entities uh, who work in the pandemic space, um, both in the US and abroad. So that brings us to the end. And um, we would love to hear from you, your thoughts on the Pandemic Center, how you'd like to get involved. Our emails and Twitter accounts are here, but um, after this event, we're also gonna be sending out a Google form group, some kind of thing to sign up so that we can, uh, more regularly communicate with you. Um, so sort of uh, keep your eyes peeled for that email. And um, but otherwise, just feel free to reach out with us. And really, thank you for your um, attention and um, interest in the topic.
and happy to take any questions that um, anyone may have. Uh, there's a hand up. I think there were going to be mics passed around or, okay. Gentleman in the blue shirt. Hi. Hi. My name's Michael Theodore. Michael. I, I'm a career counselor here in the master's program at Public mm -hmm. Health. And I was watching an episode of The Simpsons. <laughs> and um, there was a We Are the World concert that they were doing. Mm -hmm. And I remember that event took place in the 80s, but it had a global impact. Do you think we need a We Are the World moment again from artists, popular artists, that will convince the naysayers to the right side? Do you think that's possible? Um, so you're asking a middle-aged mom about popular <laughs> culture, which is a risky question, but no, I do think that engaging with the arts is actually incredibly critical. Um, I have had the privilege of being able to do that over the past couple of years. Um, I was the COVID advisor to the Borat movie, um, and I worked with John Oliver and talked to a bunch of celebrities. Anyway, I think their voices are incredibly powerful. I mean, one of the things I learned throughout the past um, two years that Kim Kardashian apparently has 300 some odd Twitter follow or Instagram followers, and I think the president has maybe 30. So I do think engaging with the arts community and, and figures that are probably more publicly visible than some of the traditional actors is, is really important, whether it's a concert, I, I don't know. But um, I do think that uh, one of the things I learned with the John Oliver team is that um, their ability to like translate these issues in ways that resonate. I mean, you know, I thought I was a decent communicator, but then when you see people who actually do this for a living do it, you, you realize, oh, they are so much more skilled at having these things resonate, have impact, compel us, um, than I think us technical people are. Yeah, and Jen, I'll just say that I think that's totally right. And some of the most effective communicators on things like vaccine hesitancy, when the first vaccines were being rolled out, were people that spoke to, to a wide variety of people across different generations and cultures. Um, I do think we need a playbook for how to engage those communities. I think every time government sort of hesitates a little bit, how do we work with this community? We, we sort of do it as a pickup game every time. And I think we need to, to have a, a more constant set of uh, engagements with with different communities in the arts um, around public health related issues so that we don't find ourselves in a situation of wondering, you know, should we have done that we are the world concert. So Jennifer, Jennifer and Beth, um, so you, you scratched on the surface, Jen, you talked about communications. How, how do we think about the next generation of communicators public health in particular, and how, how do we work that into the training of our next public health uh, leadership? Um, a few things. One is that we have to train people to be communicators, not just learn about risk communication, but train them to communicate and give them opportunities to appear on camera and to do that kind of rapid fire things that journalists do. Um, I think we have to teach people to use social media and how to use it effectively um, mm -hmm. uh, because I've probably had more impact in my career through Twitter than anything else, which is horrible to say, but that's just, I think, the world that we, we live in. Um, then I think we also have to teach people about mis and disinformation. And um, I didn't mention, but I'm really excited that the Information Futures Lab is here and they're going to be working on those issues because that is absolutely, that is probably the single biggest pandemic communications issue um, that we have to solve. Um, and uh, we need to figure out how to do that, how to uh, debunk information, how to engage, not engage, how to talk to people. I mean, many of us who were thrown in the position in the past few years of speaking to people about vaccines and other things, I mean, most of us felt like we were just winging it in part because we needed the behavioral and social science uh, to guide us to those conversations. So there's a lot more I think we need to do to train. And I think one of the things that we should look at and be a national leader on is sort of redefining the public health education around those really important skill sets. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer and Beth for joining us here at Brown. Um, I imagine there might be two very broad strategies for trying to change our preparedness for pandemics in light of what we've learned in the US. 
One is a more centrist position, where you really try to get opposing views together to see if you can find a commonality, in which case this center might be better in Ohio or Indiana. But you're here at Brown, which might suggest a different strategy, which you also talked to about advocacy and the John Oliver show and the like, and thoughts on the pros and cons of uh, a more centrist uh, consensus approach versus a more extreme uh, advocacy approach? Yeah, I mean, um, I'm not sure I would characterize advocacy as extreme because I think you can be both centrist and advocate, but um, I think your point about engaging not just from a Northeastern Ivy League institution is, is an absolutely fair one. And um, as part of our preparing democracies for pandemics projects, we're actually already having those exact same conversations about other potential partners. Um, so one of the things we've been learning about is um, some of the work that was being done in Indiana and some other uh, states where conversations are ongoing and how we can plug into those conversations, partner with the institutions that are um, leading those conversations and, um, and uh, certainly learn from the experiences in, in those states. And um, one of the things we've been talking about doing is sort of red state dialogues. Actually, Beth and I just had this conversation this afternoon about the, the red state roadshow, um, in part because I wanna learn about what approaches um, they've taken. Um, but this is also a place where uh, we need more than public health because these are there are other disciplines who can t give us point to solutions for us on this, um, the social sciences, political sciences, um, and others, and I really want to engage their expertise in, in how we approach this, but I completely recognize that the branding of um, of the our institution will limit us unless we uh, forge partnerships. I'm talking about red states in part because I'm particularly worried about the politicization, but I don't also mean red states. I think we have to also work with underrepresented communities um, whose experiences haven't necessarily made the national media either, and I think there are other institutions that we can uh, partner with um, for that work as well. Yeah, I'll just I'll add to that and say I definitely think that advocacy is critical. Whether you're, at, I think you can both advocate for public health views that are scientifically credible and backed up, and at the same time meet people where they are. This was a key f feature in the conversation that we had with Judy Monroe last week, who's the CDC Foundation um, director who worked on the Indiana commission that looked at some of these issues across across populations within their state and just being being available to meet with people where they are and understand how they experienced this pandemic how they experienced public health guidance and information how they experienced disinformation during the pandemic i think is really critical and i, I do think i have thought a lot about this issue can we do this from brown from an ivy league northeastern institution and i think the answer to that question is yes if we partner Yes, if we're willing to not only and always be out front. And I think that's what the next generation of public health leaders needs to also be prepared to be able to do. But that doesn't mean that we compromise principles about what works in public health. One thing we know that doesn't work is when half of the country does one thing and half of the country does something else. We know for a fact that that doesn't work. So we have to figure out how to get community focused solutions and bring that to communities around the country. But it's a really great question and I, I welcome a further dialogue on this because we have to get it right. Um, thank you so much for an awesome presentation. Um, you outlined a really incredibly impressive agenda of work um, and a lot of really important problems. And I think the past couple of years have made all of us really aware of them. And I was curious if you could talk a little bit about what you think some of the biggest public health successes in COVID or monkeypox have been and, and what makes you hopeful in this space. Um, yeah, I have a lot of hope. Um, a few things. Uh, I mean, one, clearly the science one in terms of, of uh, developing vaccinations, um, the distribution, you, you know, there was um, some, some uh, you know, from, from, the, from the lab to the arms, there were some breakdowns there, but absolutely that was important. I, I mentioned, um, I think the fact that we now can have the ability to test ourselves at home, not just for COVID, but RSV and flu, um, that I think is, um, you know, an important watershed moment. Obviously we have to work to improve equitable access and um, reduce the costs, you know, uh, push for paid sick leave and, and other things. I think that's um, incredibly important. I think probably the single biggest um, success is the fact that I think 
interest in public health and schools of public health has never been higher. Um, the fact that there's now you know, a whole generation of people who actually know what an epidemiologist is. <laughs> um, I used to have to explain that. I don't have to explain that anymore. Um, I, that like enthusiasm and people wanting to tackle these issues, I, I'm inc incredibly encouraged by. Um, I think, um, you know, at the early stages of the pandemic, there was some global cooperation on clinical trials. So there have been a lot of successes along the way. I think we have to, you know, point to them, of course, and amplify them and try to figure out how to build on them in, in the future. Um, in terms of monkeypox, I will say I have never been more um, just touched and inspired by the affected communities and how they self-organized to protect themselves, to advocate for what they needed, to, um, you know, uh, compile lists of where vaccines were being uh, offered. And I mean, that was really I, that the power of communities. And, you know, I think one of the reasons why we have to make sure we build communities into our plans, um, that was um, particularly extraordinary. Yeah, I, I want to just echo the hopefulness um, and say that I think we have both a huge um, a huge hope, but also a major risk. And I think the risk is that we don't capitalize on all of the things that we learned coming out of out of COVID, including that we can have a medical countermeasure for. I believe that it's possible to have a platform medical countermeasure for all path, potentially pandemic pathogen families. Um, and have vaccine candidates ready to go. I believe the 100 day mission is possible, but only if we're super organized and get the funding that we need to make it happen. I believe that we can get testing out a lot faster if we capitalize on the lessons that, that we're learning um, both from COVID and from monkeypox. And I think that's what's so exciting is that right now those lessons are fresh. We have a fresh generation of people who's, who had to sit at home for a chunk of this pandemic who are hopefully really motivated to figure out how we can keep schools open for the next one. Um, and that generation of, of hope mixed with the, the potential to actually not, you know, not be able to achieve the goals that we want, I think should be a healthy mix that will catalyze people into, into doing something. So that's what I'm excited about. Melissa Pama, who is a clinical faculty here at Brown. Um, she runs Teo Health, which is a pandemic resource for Filipino Americans. Um, and the question is, how can community organizations collaborate with the Pandemic Center? Um, reach out and we'll discuss. Um, I would you know, love to collaborate with community organizations. Um, yeah. Another question was around uh, lessons from monkeypox, and someone was curious about the controversy surrounding messaging um, around MSM. Yeah, so here's another lesson. Any time you have uh, an outbreak, epidemic, pandemic, uh, involving something unusual in some way, either it's a disease that didn't exist before, or, you know, a pathogen that didn't exist before, or something that doesn't usually circulate in some place, we have to expect that there will be attempts to stigmatize some group. This, this I have seen this over and over and over in every single event I've looked at. So we need a way to communicate in a way that one acknowledges how, who is at risk, how to protect yourselves, but that doesn't fuel stigma. And that's basically a non-answer, but we should have known going in that this is something that we have to do. And the fact that we were struggling with this, you know, 40 years after the discovery of HIV, um, speaks to important work that needs to be done and again would defer to people you know that work in the behavioral social sciences to help us figure out how to do this. One more question from our online audience. Uh, what best practices should we be focusing on during the current COVID pandemic to either reduce the chances of COVID be becoming endemic at high prevalence level or having new variants causing substantial but preventable morbidity and mortality? Um, so I can answer the mortality question, um, which is that vaccines and therapeutics, I think are our best bet forward. Obviously there are other tools we could use to reduce the likelihood of, of infection, um, but I will tell you it's really hard to stop respiratory viruses. Um, it's really hard to stop it three years into it. Um, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't try, but I think, uh, you know, I, it's funny, I keep getting asked by, by like, um, 
political or reporters like when do you think like things will go back to normal and i have to say when i you know i went to a a theater show and I was the only person masking in the entire theater I'm like I'm not sure who's asking that question anymore um and that's just the realities of 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 the world that we live in um I think probably the biggest thing that we can do is try to improve um equitable vaccine access to reduce the likelihood of of um variants from emerging by hopefully you know cutting down on the number of people who get infected and obviously other tools are important I just think that where we are politically in a lot of places it's 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 hard to maintain um, indefinitely, which is pretty much what you have to do when you have a respiratory virus. I would just add doubling down on our ability to, to get better data and have a better early warning system in the United States and to really be able to do epidemic forecasting where we know, you know, where where when we see a variant and we're able to act more even more quickly than we were able to with Omicron and not just in the United States, but globally. And that's a huge um, area of focus right now in the global health security community, which is you know, making sure that there is funding available to build capacity for disease surveillance, for genomic sequencing, and to do it sustainably, not just for COVID, but also for Ebola, for monkeypox, for, for any emerging outbreak or outbreak, to use Jen's, Jen's, um, Jen's term, that it looks unusual or is acting unusual, to find the needle in the haystack. So I know we're over time, um, so we're going to wrap up. Um, and I just wanted to mention, because there are questions around uh, how to get involved with the Pandemic Center, we will be sharing a, a Google form to everybody who um, attended today's talk, along with the webinar recording. Um, so we'd love for you to sign up for those who are interested in getting involved. Um, Jen, any final remarks? Just thank you so much. Really appreciate it. I know it's the end of the day. And I appreciate your attention. Thank you. Thank you.